Hello everyone, welcome back to another Bible study and episode review in Shady Oak Ministries. I'm of course Shady Oak, and today we'll be going over episode 14 of season 5 of the TV show My Little Pony, Friendship is Magic. The episode Canterlot Boutique, and boy what another hiatus we just survived. <laughs> Those of you who were actually there to watch these episodes unfold, it was nothing more exciting to get back into the swing of things. Not only to see the writers of the show continue to entertain us with the pony personalities we know and love and hold dear to our hearts, but as well to have God speak to us in that very unique and special way. And to begin this study where we can give God that ear and give us ears to hear his voice and his word through sometimes even the oddest of venues, I'd like you to turn with me to the book of Proverbs, chapter 3, verses 5 through 8, where we get probably one of the most well-known and well-quoted passages of the Old Testament concerning a relationship with God, that being the recurring theme of season 5. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him, and He shall direct your paths. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord, and depart from evil. It will be health to your flesh and strength to your bones. And in this we get the emphasis of the book of Proverbs, in that the term Proverbs means a wise saying. And set at its foundation, we need to understand that wisdom is our ability to not only make effective decisions, but to make the pivotal discernment about where our sources come from. Because any of you who have written any sort of essay or literary topic, or even read on a topic for that matter, you want to not only consider the material that you're reading, you know, grammatical errors and obvious mistakes that would somewhat deviate their maturity and dependability on the topic, but as well the things that you know in your heart to be true are only <laughs> are going to go so far as the person that you're willing to follow because the future of the person you're following is also becoming your future, if I can count my trajectories right on that. And noting that today's episode went a lot about recognizing discernment and the people that we're going to follow and recognizing not only where our lives lead, but where our integrity is ultimately going to make us end up. And knowing that the two greatest tragedies in life, not getting what we want and getting it, are oftentimes, well, the number one confirmations that our own heart and our own desires and what seems right to man only continues to confirm Jeremiah 17 verse 9 that the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? But in this, we get two examples of people who had different motives in the same area. They were trying to make money in a very highly prestigious environment, known as Canterlot, where not only royalty was present, but as well there was a lot of people with very high line well, reputation, so to speak, that would be able to further not only Rarity's career, but our new character that was introduced, named Sassy Saddles. And in this, we get a perfect illustration of someone who's not only going by their own gut instinct, but is actually following Satan's example, in that his number one goal for distraction, in ultimately getting our eyes off of Jesus and onto the things of this world, whether it's to overwhelm us, to prevent us from understanding how good God's character is, and then so to seeds of doubt in that time of weakness, or whatever you may want to call it as far as the enemy's work and wanting to do with our lives that's ultimately going to kill us, we not only recognize that well, Sassy Saddle's reputation as being one failed career after another, it wasn't on a lack of effort, but it was a poor illustration and method. In the book of 1 John chapter 2 verses 15 through 17, John the Apostle said this, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Now note, what this is not saying is that you're supposed to hate the world, but you're supposed to love and recognize God, and then through him all creation. We remember the commandment, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, body, soul, and strength. And as well extended on this in Jesus' uh, uh, Sermon on the Mount, known as the Beatitudes, where he says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. That the entirety summation of all of the commandments are centered in love. We need to recognize not only what to love, but also what isn't going to ultimately help us. And in this, he continues in saying that uh, all these, all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world and the world is passing away, and the lust of it. But he who does the will of God abides forever. And noting that this wisdom 
that not only King Solomon was imparting to us in Proverbs to trust God, put your dependence, your hope, and your ear and attention in the decisions that we're going to ultimately be making in life about not only what we should be pursuing, but ultimately what we need to recognize is what our greeds and our needs actually are, we see Sassy Saddle's approach being to entirely invest in the world's methods to bring out in people who aren't mature, wise, or for all intents and purposes don't have the self-control enough to say, well, that looks good, but is this a sound financial decision? You know, Is the appeal of this dress actually going to last me long term? No, you're not thinking of that. You're saying, Princess Twilight Sparkle wore it, so therefore I'm going to wear this. I feel like a princess. That kind of logic. And her whole motto and philosophy, as opposed to rarities, was appeal to the eyes, even if it's through lies. And that's the first point I want you guys to take away from this, not only in the episode, but the biblical inspiration that inspired it is that what we need to understand that when it comes down to the value of the world that we are based off of market system that supply and demand are contrary to each other the rarer something is the more demand there is for it the lower the supply the higher the demand but if you increase the supply suddenly it's everywhere it becomes commonplace and the rarity is gone and in this we see the market value is not only determining well basically the things that everyone wants the most to make as much of it until it's completely worthless but then we also see the contrary to this the opposite in rarity sense of value the makers value in that she says I love you and made you special and in this we get an illustration of God's heart and why he doesn't give the same blessings and the same opportunities and the same callings why can't everyone be a pastor because not everyone was tailor-made to that that we are all unique as individuals and need to understand that just like our cutie marks, just like our main colors, just like all these different personalities are meant to be set and appealed and not only someone that God has individually fallen in love with, that includes you. But even more so beyond this, that along with the unique character and personality that God has made you, he is also trying to tailor a life and a calling and an opportunity to serve him that is just is going to be just as enjoyable as a husky would be pulling a sleigh as much as, say, a lion would be in hunting antelope and as much as a cow would be comfortable in grazing on grass and just basically supporting its family. It's doing the thing that it's designed to do. And just like I wouldn't have as much fun pulling a sleigh as a husky dog, it's because I'm designed for something different. Like you guys could probably tell at this point that I enjoy my calling not only as a brony, but as a Bible teacher. And that my job as a pastor is not just limited to only teaching exclusively in the themes that are presuppositioned and approved by the church. No, I'm led by God and told and just basically given the opportunity and privilege to share the things that God speaks with me to you because that's the definition of prophecy to speak from God from one's heart but also noting that that filter needs to be put in check that as long as I'm following with God you guys can take at least some semblance of my words not because I'm saying them but because God's speaking them and if you guys don't go home after this or if you are homeless on your computer and don't confirm this for yourselves. I, I don't want you to take anything I say into regard. I want you to know the facts and the reality that God is speaking through this show. And that the reason why he's given us not only our talents, our abilities, our individuality, but even our hobbies and interests is the whole point this channel was created. But again, even going back to the point that was made, we see an example in the Bible in Jeremiah chapter 1 and verse 5 where God said, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you. I set you apart. I ordained you a prophet to the nations. That just like Jeremiah's calling, and note, the time historically that he'd be speaking as a prophet in Israel is going to be one of the most nasty times you could ever imagine. It made the well, the Great Depression looked like the Roaring Twenties, if we were going to use the United States example. Even more so than that, even in horrible times, we all have a very special purpose. And again, that being included, what Jesus said in John 17, 24, when he was praying for us, said, Father, I desire that they also whom you gave me may be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory, which you have given me, for you loved me before the foundation of the world. And noting that our purpose and ultimate goal in life is to enjoy, experience, and 
well, for all intents and purposes, be joined back to our relationship with Jesus Christ. That's the whole point of what Proverbs and 1 John were getting to, is that Jesus, and also simultaneously presented in Rarity's approach in today's study, was not, well, if people like it, if it makes people feel good, if it's the latest happening thing, if it makes everyone think that you're the greatest, if you're popular, just like all of the incredible fan base contributions to the show that we've gotten, like Button Mash and Flufflepuff, if everyone had their own thing to contribute, it would just be like the church in Corinthians where everyone had something to prophesy and no one could understand what was being said because everyone was talking at once. If there wasn't any rarity, individuality, or unique gift and calling to speaking the word of God, then it wouldn't be of any value. And the same thing is also true in this show. If Button Mash weren't such a novelty, if Flufflepuff wasn't so unique and funny, if Lullaby for a Princess wasn't such an amazing and fantastic work of art by the fan base and commentating on what it must have been like emotionally and the impact of Celestia, I mean a fictional character, but investing their time and talent into such things that just make such an impact on our lives, these things would not be special if everyone could do them. And God has given a measure of grace to each one, which is why this was Jesus' approach himself when he was setting the example for what a human life enjoying a relationship with God was all about, because that's what he came here to do. To not just demonstrate like, hey, I'm God, I'm perfect, you're not, see ya. But he was actually saying, look, this is the life you can have. I'm giving it not only for you, but to you, so that you could not only see and touch and feel me, but enjoy me and know that I'm trustworthy and a friend worth having. And his character represented in the annals of history 2,000 years later continues to receive echoes of that person that we're just attracted to in the lives and personalities and hearts and just overall natures of the main six. And in this we also see that in John chapter 6 verse 38 through 40, this was his whole purpose. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. This is the will of the Father who sent me, that all he has given me I should lose nothing, but should raise it up at the last day. This is the will of him who sent me, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. And that's what it ultimately comes down to, is that God has not only given everyone many decisions and opportunities and abilities to make these choices in life, but actually acknowledging their choices. Because the freedom of choice is useless if you don't acknowledge even the wrong choices, and thus we call that in life our mistakes. And yet we have a God who's patient enough to be, well, patient with us and allow us to learn from them. But there was no greater example of not only to not make everyone wealthy and healthy, but we see some of the most controversial statements in the Bible where Moses was talking to God and he just kept saying, no, I'm not qualified. I can't do that. I can't speak for you. I can't speak for Israel. And God said, who made man's mouth? Who made the deaf, the mute, the seen, or the blind? Did not I? God is the one who not only introduced handicaps, but gives opportunities, and it's all for a specific reason. And note, I'm not here to tell you the full monotony on God's will as to how these things will work out any more than Rarity could claim that well, Sassy Saddles had a one up or one below on her until she had actually seen the fruit of her labor. We'll all find out what our lives are ultimately meant to recognize and be the full submission of them when we stand before him face to face, but we see no better example of someone who's not only given a lot of opportunity, but a lot of handicaps as well than John the Baptist. I mean, this guy, he was like the opposite of appealing. I mean, concerning the issue of fashion, Cantalot Boutique, he clearly did not visit that department. He said it wore, he wore camel's hair and lived out in the desert and his average daily diet was honey and locusts. I can't imagine that does well for your breath. Even more so, his message was not the feel-good message of the century like Joel Osteen. You know what he said? Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He told people not only that they were sinners, but what they had to do to make up for it to prepare the way for what? Their Redeemer. The Messiah was coming. That was his whole message, even prophesied 700 years in advance by Isaiah. An incredible calling, an incredible man, that Jesus himself said, among those born of women, in Matthew 11:11, 11, 11, there is not one born greater than John the Baptist. But here's the real shocker. He who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. Because here's the real reality. 
what did John the Baptist's life ultimately end up amounting to? Well, if we were only to look at it from the physical perspective, if we were only going to look at how many of the orders that Rarity had checked off on the box and saying like, okay, we got this many princess things, we got this many, no princess dresses were being ordered. The guy barely even dressed like a slave in the servant's house. He was a servant to the king. But even more so than that, what gave Jesus just the sheer adulation and praise of this guy? And noting that he was the greatest prophet who had ever walked the face of the earth, greater than Moses, greater than Elijah or Elijah, or any of the other, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, any of these other people. Why? Because even towards the end of his life, when he was brought into doubt and just ultimately, just actually it was a really sad set of circumstances that I don't actually want to get into. You can read it on your own time, the story of Herodias, uh, Herod, uh, Tetrarch's, um, niece who is also the it's a very messed up story but anyway sleazy girl convinced this king to bring her mom the king's husband wife the head of john the baptist on a platter because he made a bet that he should have thought through more when he was getting a lap dance from her anyway um yeah this is in the bible you can look it up but what did john the baptist's life ultimately amount to well if we only look from the physical perspective he ended up getting his head cut off in prison because a girl cashed in on a very big tip at a strip club not really much to be proud of but what was his life ultimately meant to accomplish John's ultimate goal and motive was to share with people the King is coming, that the Messiah, the Redeemer, the forgiveness of sins, and the ultimate Redeemer and King of Israel was coming, and that quoting him himself in his last message before he would be thrown into prison, before he would literally be tossed aside and basically considered all but fodder, he just basically said, I must decrease, he must increase. I am the one who is meant to let the world know he was coming, and now that he's here, my job is done. Because it ultimately comes down to this, he who does not have the Father does not have life. He who has the Father has eternal life. And it all comes down to this, that what made John the Baptist the greatest of all prophets in the face of the earth, is the same reason why we as Christians have the greatest opportunity that even the Old Testament prophets were longing to have the opportunity for not only fellowship with God's Holy Spirit, but the opportunity to tell the world that they have a choice that not only affects their lives, their career, their decisions and choices today, but their eternity in years to come. Because just like Rarity's dress was meant to basically be, you know what? Forget the princess dress. Forget everyone having to look like Twilight Sparkle. Forget everyone having to feel good all the time. Because here's the thing. If you feel good today, it, <laughs> if you do something nice for somebody or something is done nice to you, you feel great. But then, I mean, you could be given a new car. But the moment the car gets in a wreck, when you pull it out of the driveway or find out that the new car actually didn't have an engine, you'd be sad again. Do you understand how poor a motive your emotions are? Because it's not necessarily the good things that happen to us, it's the good things that come out of us that ultimately matter, that make those echoes in eternity that Paul the Apostle was talking about. And it even goes into such beautiful detail that one day when we're joined with Jesus once again like a bride is to her husband, where not literally we'll be married and engaging in those marital affairs, but that just as a husband is meant to care for, love, and take care of his wife, in the perfect way that God intended, mind you, with him being the perfect husband, not only the perfect gentleman, he will make us a part of him forever. And with that in mind, it says in Revelation chapter 19 and verse 8, it was granted to her to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints, that our lives will ultimately be the wedding dress we wear before God's throne when we're joined to Jesus once again. Now guys, for those of you hearing this and you're just like, that kind of sounds a little off. It's a symbol meant to describe that oneness of relationship and the thing that we'll ultimately have to show for our lives is not only the things that God's given us the opportunity to wear, but it's the things that he himself made clean. Because as I recall, our good deeds, Isaiah said, are as filthy rags before him. And that term in the Hebrew was the word that was used to describe menstrual cloths. 
nothing could be short of graphic in saying that it's not our good deeds, our good intentions, our good will, but it's ultimately the one who's not only waiting for us at the door of the boutique to welcome us in, but it's the one knocking also to come in. Because just as God needs to be the ultimate one who gives your heart not only that discerner's eye, that attention to detail that made rarity so unique and special in her calling, but even more so that God's calling for your life to not only know the external, but the internal and the ability to change not only the most important part about you, your heart, but to even walk with you and grow with you and wait on you even to this moment and show you what it means to actually not only have a life worth living, but a dress worth showing to angelic hosts one day. That your life is meant to be used powerfully by God, but it won't come if you only look by the world's means. If you're going to be like Sassy Saddles, go ahead and try. Your career will end as quickly as it has started, and she was more than prepared to walk away. But just like Rarity was not willing to give up her, Jesus is not willing to give up on you either, because Jesus himself said in Revelation chapter 3 and verse 20, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him, and he with me. And he's not only here to partake of your merchandise in your boutique and store, to enjoy the things that make you who you are, but even make himself a part of you and the righteousness and that right relationship before God that ultimately makes him more unique than any other human being in history is that he lived a perfect life and he offers that to you and all he wants from you is you because it's you he fell in love with it was your specific dress and your design and clothes that's not only meant to match your life and personality as much as monotone pony and prissy sunshine pony were meant to have luna and celestia specific dresses and i want to ask you do you want to be able to enjoy jesus today walk with him today and experience his love today. That's the choice that you can make today. And if you want to acknowledge him and his word and say, let he who thirsts come. Let all who desire, let him take the water of life freely. This is available to you. These dresses are not only on sale, they're freely given, but you have to accept them. And that's all it takes. Thank you for your time and listening to this study. I hope it's been a blessing to you. If you'd like to know more about the topics discussed in this episode or perhaps have questions that seem familiar to you that God may be speaking to you and you'd like more insight on, leave them in the comments below. If you'd like to encourage the ministry, please leave a like. It's a great encouragement. But most importantly, if you want to help the gospel go out to our beloved fan base, please share this study with anyone and everyone you feel would be blessed by it. Thank you for your time and God bless you.